Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of Screw It, Let's Do It by Richard Branson, Lessons in Life. It's a little book um, based on a bigger book, I reckon. He's got, you just told me this, his other book, Losing My Virginity, has got the exact same front cover. Exact same front. I don't know if, as a billionaire, if he's got any other photos out there. You probably could have hired a photographer for a day. <laughs> you could have done a standalone photo shoot for the book cover, oh, surely. Same photo on the front of this book. Same photo on the back of this book <laughs> and same photo on the front of his... And it's a shocking photo. <laughs> anyway, he's a legendary man. He's, he's done very, very well. He's done very well for himself. He's, uh, he's, I think he's, what, he's just cracked over 70 and uh, in his 70 years of life, he's formed over 400 uh, companies in various different fields. Obviously, the, the founder of the Virgin Group, which has just gone absolutely gangbusters. Yes, he's got over 400 companies. So, his world were known as one of the most... Um, outrageous entrepreneurs in many ways, as we're about to find out in this book. The staff at Virgin, they've got a nickname for him. Apparently, they call him Dr. Yes. Now, I don't know, you'd have to be pretty high up the chain, I reckon, to be talking to Branson, first of all, and then to not call him Mr. Branson or mm. Sir, but calling him Dr. Yes. But apparently, that's what some people call him. Yeah, that's what he says. But this is because he never says, I can't do this because I don't know how. He's always going to give it a go. You no, know, if, if you're someone in the company and you come up with an idea and you bring it to him, He's just going to say yes. He's not going to knock anything down. Yeah, he doesn't believe in words like can't. And he says that those words, those feelings, those thinking, they shouldn't stop you. He's got a little motto. He says whenever someone brings a crazy idea, you might think about it for a bit. And no matter how bizarre, he'll eventually say, screw it, let's do it. So as the title of the book suggests, this is what it's all about. It's about his story, his lessons in life and the things that we can learn from him, him 70 years into his life and still kicking. So uh, lots to learn from Big Dick. So let's get into it. Branson says that even if you don't have the right experience to reach your goal, then look for another way in. He says, for example, if you want to fly, get down to the airfield at age 16 and start making tea for the pilots. Or if you want to be a fashion designer, but you haven't gone to art school, then just join a fashion company, maybe sweep the floors, be the cleaner, push in the broom at night, gradually talk to people and work your way up. His inspiration for this sort of uh, philosophy came from his mum. So during the Second World War, she wanted to be a pilot. And at the time, it was hard for women to get in as a pilot at the time. But she went to the airfield anyway to get the job. Um, she was a ballet dancer at the time, so she didn't really look like a bloke at that time. So she'd be pretty hard to spot at this stage. Yeah, the first day she went for the job and they said, no, nah, sorry, men only. So she thought, okay, well, what can I do here? The second day she went back, she had a big heavy leather jacket. She hid her, uh, her long blonde locks in a bun beneath a flying helmet. She talked with a deep voice and somehow she got the job that she wanted and she was able to become a pilot. Yes, I watched Mulan last week and it's this exact <laughs> modern incarnation of the Mulan. The old, new one or the old one? The new one, like a lot of Disney movies, are a bit more disappointing than the old one. But <laughs> I, thought it was, I thought it was all right, the new one. Yeah, give it a see. But anyway, she got out there, she learned to glide and it turned out she was actually very good at what she did. So she began teaching the students and these were young men about to go into the Battle of Britain. So she, this was a wild, wild person. Yeah, so she did pretty well there. I wonder if she was hiding her agenda the whole time or if eventually once she was in, she was like, well, I got you guys. Yeah, I, I think know. it's probably when she was uh, in, at once the in. end of the first battle and then she um, put the thing <laughs> off and then they threatened to slay her. But she, uh, that's the movie. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, then after the war, then she wanted to be an air hostess. Um, but at the time... There was a few rules. You had to be able to speak English and Spanish, and she couldn't speak Spanish. You also had to be trained as a nurse, uh, but she wasn't trained as a nurse. But So she thought, well, I want to get in. How else can I uh, use my wits to get in here? And apparently, Branson used the word she chatted up the night manager at the airline, and uh, he put her name on the list and got her in for the training the next day. It's an easy way to get it done. Richard Branson, on the other hand, so zooming forward and went to he was alive. When he was 15 years old, he started um, a little paper called Student Magazine when he was at high school. And everyone told him, look, mate, you're too young. You're too inexperienced. Obviously, if your little 15-year-old popped up, like, we'd say the same to him, right? But, yeah. How could you start a magazine when you're 15? You've got no idea what goes into it. Yeah. You'd almost, you know, scruffle him on the head and <laughs> give a little giggle and tell him to keep, keep, you know, moving on to the next thing and go and play with the kids. But... <laughs> Big dick, he had different ideas. Yeah, he did his sums with care. He worked out how much it would cost for the paper, how much it would cost for the ink, how much it would cost for the first batch to, to print the first batch of copies for the first edition. Then he said, okay, well, this is how much it's going to cost me. Uh, how much do I need to bring in then as income from advertising? How can I sell some space in the magazine to not only pay for itself, but then also keep, keep a little bit of a slice for himself as well? 
So at this ripe early age, he got a four-pound business loan from his mum to buy stamps. Uh, and once they got going, they actually got their first check, which was 250 pounds, which is a huge sum of money for school kids back in the 1960s. Yeah, massive. And really, all it, all it was to get started was just sending out a whole bunch of letters to big companies um, and to famous people trying to get them at, uh, as interviews on the magazine. And after that 250 bucks, uh, he thought, okay, well, this is going all right here. Um, I think it's time for me to drop out of high school, which is a pretty bold, pretty bold thing to do as a 16-year-old. As he left, his headmaster said, hey, Branson, I predict you'll either go to prison or become a millionaire. Yeah, telling, uh, very telling prediction. It could, it could go either of two ways. You'd hope it goes for the millionaire path. Obviously, it did. Um, and uh, what he actually ended up doing for that very first edition was he generated 8,000 pounds in ad revenue, not profit, but ad revenue for that very first edition. So he got his first 250 pound check and then suddenly those checks started rolling in. Eight grand, not bad. Not bad at all. And they also secured some big, big interviews with big dogs of the likes of, say, John Lennon and Mickey Jagger. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of other magazines (laughs) that couldn't land these blokes. Yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, But they also had a serious side as well. As the magazine got rolling, they also sent out their own freelance reporters to cover the big issues of the day. Like they had people covering the Vietnam War and the famine in Nigeria. So this was from this like 15-year-old kids magazine. It started getting pretty serious, getting John Lennon, Mick Jagger, sending people to Nigeria. Uh, It was pretty serious. So from starting in the basement, eventually it grew and grew in a bit further and they expanded to a second store, then a third and then more. And soon they actually had a store in almost every town. Branson hadn't even hit 20 years old yet. Cash was flying in faster than he could count it, but he wasn't content and he wanted to keep growing and growing bigger and bigger and wanted to start more and more businesses. So that's a, that was a pretty serious start to his, his business career. Um, we fast forward a little bit in life. And aside from his business side, he also has a pretty wild side as well, a very adventurous side. Oh, there's many stories in the book about him jumping on hot air balloons and um, I didn't know he had this side, but he's absolutely insane, this bloke. <laughs> big, big time. So, he won an event in Britain once called the Blue Ribbon, uh, which was setting a new world record for the fastest time in a powerboat to cross the ocean from America to Ireland. That's it's a pretty arbitrary <laughs> That's a goal. Super weird thing, isn't it? Yeah. And then the day after he won the blue ribbon, a Swedish bloke named Per Lindstrom came to him and said, "Hey, do you want to cross it again? But this time in a hot air balloon." <laughs> and Branson, he'd never even been in a hot air balloon, and he's like, "How the hell can you go from America to Europe in a hot air balloon?" But of course, what did he say? Screw it, let's do it. That's exactly what he said. But Branson, he is obviously a wild man. He likes to take risks. But throughout his whole career, business and his adventures, he's always taken calculated risks. This is extremely important. Um, they always have to have rigorous planning as much as possible in preparation to minimize the absolute downside that can come about. There's a fair downside from going in a hot air balloon from America to Europe. So, of course, to try to mitigate some of that risk, he spent months and months preparing, practicing, learning a whole range of potential disaster scenarios and what to do about it, how you can uh, save yourself when things go wrong. And after all that training, him and uh, his mate Per Lindstrom, they popped over to America, jumped in the hot air balloon, started heading up and thought, okay, well, let's go to let's go to Europe. Let's go to Europe and uh, they hit the jet stream perfectly. So, what happens? You have to get high enough in the air for a jet stream. It's a bit like a current in a river. It kind of just like zooms you, you know, at a much faster speed. And so they're going very high in the air and they hit the jet streams and 29 hours just going like very, very fast (laughs) in this stream. Um, They finally made it to to Ireland, but then there was this one problem. Like they got up and how do we land now? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. They'd made it to their destination, but the problem was that they hadn't spent enough fuel that they thought. So they still had some fuel tanks. They said, well, we can't just go and crash down because otherwise we'll explode. Mm. So they thought, okay, how can we get down? They gradually, slowly, slowly, slowly lowered themselves down and they thought, okay, well, we've got this extra tank of fuel. Let's cut it off. We'll set it free so then we can land safely without exploding. But the problem was as soon as they cut that heavy tank free, then the air balloon shot right way back up in the air because they dropped so much weight, they shot up and they thought, oh shit, wait, how do we, now how do we get down again? They found a way to get closer to the, the ground level. Um, so they were near the beach, near the ocean and when they got close enough, uh, Dick's so-called mate in parenthesis here, <laughs> um, Per, he said, All right, we're going to jump now and he just jumped. <laughs> he just jumped himself and then because he made the hot air balloon so much lighter, 
um, Big Dick just kept floating back right into the air and into the sky. So he was in a bit of trouble, bit of a strife. You'd, you'd think it'd be like a three, two, one jump, <laughs> but mm. Pearl was like, "No, nah. okay, you ready? Let's go." Branson was ready, <laughs> and so Branson was stuck flying back up. Um, and so he was going way high, and he was floating, floating, floating. He was kind of out of control. He couldn't really control it much. I didn't have any fuel. Uh, it was too light. And then eventually, though, he popped out from the fog, and he saw a helicopter, and the helicopter was there to save him. So the helicopter uh, was able to grab him, and they said, he said, oh, that's good. I'm, I'm glad that Purr got out early. And they're like, oh, who's Purr? Mm. Where'd he go? <laughs> they hadn't picked up Purr yet. So Branson said, oh, this is where he is. They hovered through the fog. They eventually found him and like literally just moments before he froze to death, they were able to, to winch him out of the sea. Yeah, Justin, pretty insane story here. But the whole point of it, there is a few lessons he's got along the way in his adventures, in his business adventures also. But there's one obvious one and that is if you want to do something that sounds like a lot of fun, just go out there and do it. But there's also the important ones like prepare well, have faith in yourself, help each other out and never give up. Now, I think uh, we're going to call out... Well, he... <laughs> He's telling bullshit in one area. Either, <laughs> let's face it, he's, he's, he's saying he takes calculated risks. I think he could have worked out if you take weight off a hot air balloon. <laughs> right? So, anyway. It was, he says he takes risks but calculated risks. I don't know how calculating he was to say, okay, well, the odds of getting across from America to Europe in a hot air balloon, yeah, I'll take that's a That's a risk worth taking. Mm. I don't know what the upside is there. Mm. There's a lot of downside. I suppose aside from the fun trip, I think there's a bit of survivorship really bias here as well. For every yeah. 10 Bransons, you've probably got one who's writing this book and the other nine um, shot off in the hot air balloon into space <laughs> and right. not talking about their calculator risk. They sh- <laughs> they're saying they should have prepared better. Anyway, he's, he's here to live the tell of the tale and he's got a lot of lessons. Um, and obviously, screw it, just do it. That's what he lives and breathes by. Branson being a billionaire, he always gets asked the question, mate, how do I make money? He's always got the same reply. He says, there's no secret. There are no rules to follow in business. You just have to work hard and believe that you can do it. And most of all, you got to go out there and try and have some fun. Yeah. Branson said he didn't set out to be rich. All he wanted to do was to challenge himself in life and have fun. And that's kind of what he still does as well. He's not saying that money isn't important. Like we're not cave people. We have to have some money to survive. But Branson said, look, as long as I've got one breakfast, one lunch, and one dinner every day, and I'm having a bit of fun, then I'm satisfied. That's it. He never went into business to make money, but he found that money was a little side effect that if he went out there to have fun, it seems to correlate with more money coming in. So if it stops being funny, he asks himself, why is it not fun anymore? And then if he, he might go and try and fix it, and if he can't make it fun, then he'll stop doing it altogether. His very first money-making scheme, so even before that magazine, he was nine years old. And he came up with what he thought was this incredible idea. His family had like a, a big backyard, probably a backyard's an understatement, like, you know, out in, the, out in the rural area, they had a bit of a paddock behind the house. And he said, well, how about I grow Christmas trees? Uh, the, the profit margins he calculated were insane. Like the seeds were super cheap. All you had to do, buy one bag of seeds, plant a whole bunch of trees, wait for 18 months, and then the following Christmas, sell them for a ridiculous profit. Yeah, that's it. So, bag of seeds, five pounds, sold them for two pounds each per tree. That's, yeah, 795 pound profit. That's 16,000% ROI. <laughs> so, even an eight year old, right? That's a, that's a big, big money. Yeah, that's right. So, that was his first business lesson when he was nine years old was the, the, the lesson of maths and figures and projections and saying that, okay, if I don't take 500 seeds, it only cost me this much, multiply it out, this is my profit. That was a good lesson to learn. But then his second lesson, in business was that money doesn't grow on trees. The problem was every time that seed popped up to a little seedling and it was on the way to becoming a tree, a rabbit would run along and eat it and there goes all his profit. Which brings us to his third lesson in business was to plan well like he already had, but also go out there and be flexible with what your business might be. So given the Christmas tree plan wasn't going well, all the rabbits out there were eating all his, his profits and his big big money. So he went out there and pivoted. He got his revenge on those rabbits. He went out there, got his shotgun with uh, <laughs> Uncle Rick. I threw that bit in there, but I'm sure there's always an uncle who loves killing rabbits, some family members. So Definitely. he went out there and um, shot all the rabbits and yeah. got his revenge and um, had a lot of fun doing it. Well, that's what he did. So he shot the rabbit. He picked, a, picked up the carcass, went to the butcher, sold them for a couple of cents each, and he was actually able to break even. 
And so that was, uh, even though he obviously he only spent his five pounds on seeds, but he was able to get his five and a bit pounds back to make a small profit. Plus, all of his friends and family got a bit of fresh rabbit pie. Absolutely. So he's eight eight years old with a shotgun, or nine years old with a shotgun here. <laughs> Apparently, maybe, <laughs> maybe a bit of salt and pepper, but it's a great. <laughs> no. Never get, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> I right. saw that come up in a in a nice uh, TV show recently. <laughs> now, fast forward to 1977. Branson, he'd started Virgin Records, gone on a signing spree. He travelled the world looking for hidden gems, finding the unsigned talents in places that he could make on a big budget. Um, and by the end of his trip, he was exhausted and needed a break. So he invited a lady friend he knew out to meet him in Jamaica, uh, which was the last leg of his music search tour. So once they'd finished, they'd signed all these Jamaican artists, uh, the you know undiscovered talent that he could tap into and make the massive in the UK. Then they thought, okay, time for our holiday. Let's go to Puerto Rico so we can finish off our holiday. But as soon as he got to the airport, he found that his flight had been cancelled and the next flight wasn't for ages. So he thought, well, I really want to go on holiday here. Um, most of the people who also want to go on their holiday or want to go to Puerto Rico for whatever reason, they were roaming around the airport. They were looking lost. Nobody was doing anything. They just thought, okay, well, we're, we're out of luck here. We're going to have to come back next week. So Branson thought, I'm going to take some action here. He went and chartered a small private plane. It was a 50-seater, and it cost him two grand for this one flight. So pretty outrageous at this point, right? Like talking about taking action and taking responsibility and not choosing the victim path. I mean, it's a pretty easy victim path to, to just complain that the air, airlines aren't, you know, aren't running. But to be bold enough to go and just around the airport, try and find someone to hire a plane, a uh, 50-seater for 2000 bloody insane. So the next thing he did, he got a sign and said, all right, Virgin Airways, single flight to Puerto Rico, 39 bucks. Yeah, not bad. Obviously, he probably, he probably didn't need all 50 seats for himself and he probably didn't really have the want to be spending two grand. So he thought, well, there's you know 48 other people here whose flight also just got cancelled. Maybe we can all help each other out. And even though Branson, he'd never chartered a plane before, he saw this as an opportunity and he took it and he seized it. It was similar to all his other business ventures. He's always on the lookout for opportunities like this that most people just think nothing of it or think, okay, I've I've got screwed over here. He just thinks, okay, well, here's an opportunity. How can I do something about it? Yeah, tap into uncertainty. There's a lot of, I mean, we're going to do shoe dog at some stage and uh, a lot of the, the entrepreneurial stories start from these emerging ideas that just pop up out of nowhere, sort of tapping into uncertainty, just trying things and tinkering around and, you know, before you know it, uh, you've got a business that's working well. And as we all know today, that's the origin story of Virgin Airlines, just a wild story where just a wild man just um, just winged it and just tried to go on a holiday and we got a Virgin Airlines today, which is an outrageous success. Yeah, the, the time the book was written, which was 10 or 12 years ago, they were flying to 30 destinations around the world. That also splintered off divisions like Virgin Australia, Virgin Europe, Virgin Nigeria, plus they're in the works with Virgin America. And probably even more exciting at the time, he was writing about this 10 or 12 years ago, was Virgin Galactic. So at the time he was writing, it was kind of just a dream, just a vision, another way for Branson to have fun, like he says, his, his goal in business is to have fun. And what Virgin Galactic was going to be was to offer space flights And obviously, at the time, nobody was doing that. So, in the space of 35 years, Branson and Virgin Airlines went from renting a little plane all the way to space travel. Yeah. And as we know, obviously, the book was written, I think, 2006 or 2008 or something. There was just an idea in 2021, June 2021, he did it. Big old Branson, he went up there, um, checked out space and uh, yeah, pretty good to read, you know, this book where he's actually dreaming about it and then 15 years later, he actually did it. Mm. And his whole point through all of this is just... uh, as we were saying, it, everything needs to be fun for him. And if it's not fun, it's time to move on. Safe to say, I think going to, up to space sounds like a lot of fun. I'd <laughs> like to do that yeah. one day. Um, life is way too short to be unhappy, whatever you're doing. If you're waking up stressed and miserable and you're doing it every single day, it's not a good way to live your life whatsoever. Yeah, people always ask Branson, look, mate, you've made a truckload of money. When are you going to retire? When are you going to stop? And he always says, well, what would I do? And they say, well, maybe play golf, take up painting, like just go and have fun. But he says, well, I'm kind of already having fun. My work is fun. That's the whole point. So he says that if he's already having fun, then why would he change anything? So whilst having fun is Branson's number one most important lesson in business, another vital one is to also have respect because one of the biggest and best and most important lessons that Branson learned was actually when he did something illegal. 
So Branson in the 1970s, he was a bit of a long-haired hippie. Him and his mates used to love going out there and just, you know, breaking the law a little bit, playing around, messing around as you do back then. He wanted to go out there and be as bold as possible. He was adventurous and obviously a risk taker as we know from some of his stories so far. And it was all well and good to take risks and have a bit of fun until he kind of got caught taking a few too many risks. At the time, Virgin, they were known for selling cool cut price records. Um, he expanded this record store to have a whole bunch of different stores. And then because they kind of were selling cheaper records, he got this massive order from Belgium. Um, and the, 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 the rules at the time were if you sold from the UK to Belgium, you didn't have to pay any tax. So Branson, with this big order, he went to the record companies and he said, hey, I've got this big order. Can you sell me a whole bunch of cheap records? He got his tax-free records. Then he jumped on the ferry to go to France to then drive him to Belgium, hired a van for the day and thought, okay, great. This is, I can make a bit of money from this one big order. So when he left for the ferry port in England, they stamped his papers with the number of records he was exporting out of the country. And when he landed in France, they asked for proof that he wasn't going to sell them in France. And he showed them this order from Belgium and he explained that, hey, he was just driving, you know, to just to drop them off going through France. And even though he was just passing uh, through, there was French law saying that what he owned was bonded stock. And they told him that he had to pay tax on the records in France also. Yeah, he tried to argue with them, but eventually he lost. He thought, well, the point of this was to sell cheap tax-free records. And if I've got to pay tax on them, then it's, it's kind of no point doing it. So he was a bit pissed off that he'd wasted a day and he'd, he'd lost this big order. But he thought, well, it's not worth paying the tax. So he just turned around on the next ferry and went back to England. But then when he was kind of driving back, he thought, hang on, this could be another opportunity here. I've got all these tax-free records. I've got the stamps on the on the paper saying that they've been exported and that the, the taxes doesn't need to be paid on them. So if I can kind of sell these for what they would cost in the UK, I can kind of make a bit of extra coin. And he thought, well, with all these records, I can actually make an extra 5,000 pounds selling these tax-free records for a bit of extra markup. Yeah, we all, all bullshit on our tax returns a little bit to just start, <laughs> you know, put a bit of just to add that little bit of extra income as we do. It feels like you're bending the rules a little bit. You're not really breaking the law. And this is exactly what Richard Branson thought he was doing. He thought he was trying to do the right thing in the first place. I mean, Virgin as a company, they were still 15K in in the red in terms of uh, business debt. So every little bit and every little opportunity found like this was going to help them as a company survive. Yeah, he thought a little bit of luck had come his way. He thought it was kind of fate that like the universe was kind of helping him out. He'd been working really hard, working really hard. And then he's kind of found this loophole here, which he thought was the universe saying, here's a little bit of a reward, mate. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, it's one of the stories you tell yourself if you stumble upon a money-making opportunity like that. And he thought, okay, well, this is pretty good. And he probably would have got away with it too. But then he got a little bit greedy. After that first one he'd sold and made that extra five grand of profit, he thought, well, I can probably do it again. I can probably make up this same story. Get a, get a fake order from Belgium, get the tax-free records from the company, get my papers stamped from the authority saying I've exported it out of the UK, head over to the ferry, get to France. France will tell me, no, you've got to pay tax. He'll pretend like he didn't know what was up. And he thought, oh, damn. Uh, I guess if I can't, I, I'm going to have to go back, goes back to England. He's got his tax-free records. He's got his stamps on the paper, sell them for a bit of a markup and make some more profit. Did it a second time, got away with it. Did a third time, got away with it. Got a fourth time and this is where you're getting super confident <laughs> but he didn't even bother getting on the ferry. He just got his stamp from the customs, drove through the gate, did a circle, drove back to the other gate. <laughs> so he was getting a bit arrogant thinking this is so easy but uh, eventually it didn't turn out as easy as, as he thought because he was getting a tip that Virgin Records was about to get raided. Yeah, he had this scam going and as he said, he pushed his luck a bit and he kind of got busted. And uh, the next day, the cops were going to burst into his warehouse. So Branson said, look, we've got a day. Let's let's hide all these records. He, he hid all these ones. He took them out of the warehouse, put them in all the stores and thinking, oh, well, they're going to raid the warehouse. They're not going to raid the stores. The next day when the cops burst into the warehouse, he kind of had to hide his little sheepish cheeky grin because he knew that they weren't going to find anything in the warehouse. Yeah, but simultaneously they were checking out the stores <laughs> and he was caught red-handed. He was thrown in prison um, and he thought only criminals were being arrested. That's, that's other people. He thought he was just being a playful, fun, hippie pirate. But it really dawned on him, like being in this cold cell, that he is actually a criminal himself. Mm. And then he remembered his headmaster's words from that day he dropped out at age 16 from high school. He's, and the, the principal said, Branson, you're either going to go to prison or become a millionaire. He hadn't become a millionaire at that point. So he realized, oh, shit, the, the old principal was right. I thought he was just being a dick. But yeah, far out, I'm going to prison. 
Exactly. Well, the principal was yeah very prophetic there. It turns out he went to prison and <laughs> became a millionaire. So, two for one deal for Big Dick. <laughs> As he lay on that bare plastic mattress in the cell that night, and he was kind of thinking about the the things he'd done wrong, and he, he he vowed that he would never do anything like that again. He remembered the words that his parents had drummed into him when he was a kid. They said that all you've got in life is your good name. You can be rich, but it doesn't count for anything if people don't trust you. So from that point on, he committed to spending the rest of his life doing the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. And ever since this experience, Branson has asked himself, how far is he willing to go out there and achieve his goals? And his answer since then has always been the same. You go as far as you possibly can to get it done, but without breaking the law because your reputation is is everything. And his lesson to anyone, if you're going out there and going to start a business, uh, is this, be fair in all your dealings, aim to win and kick ass, but never cheat. Here's a quote for you. If you want milk, don't sit on a stool in the middle of the field in the hope that the cow will come back to you. <laughs> it's an old saying. I guess it doesn't work today because you could you could probably get on Uber Eats and get the milk <laughs> get delivered. Milk. So it's, anyway, but uh, there's another version of this is what uh, Richard's mum said was, come on, Ricky, don't just sit around. Go and catch the cow. There's a third one here. An old recipe for rabbit pie says, step one. Catch the rabbit. Yeah, a, if you want to cook a rabbit pie, you got to go and get that rabbit. It doesn't say step one, go and stand in the kitchen and wait till someone slaps a, a rabbit on the bench. You got to go and catch that rabbit again. Probably a bit of an old one. I don't know how many people are eating rabbit pie, let alone going and catching their own rabbits. But uh, makes sense. Like the lesson is, you know, you got to go and stand on your own two feet. You got to go and get stuff. If you want to do something, you got to go and get it done yourself. So these lessons were drilled into Richard when he was just a toddler. He was trained from an early age. He'd go out and think for himself and it's on him to get things done. You know, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. Um, And when he was four years old, his mum stopped the car a mile from his house and said, get out, get out, Richard. See if you can find your your way back home. (laughs) That's a fair challenge for a four-year-old. Four-year-old's pretty young, man. That's a long walk. (laughs) My niece, Ruby, I think she's... I'd be very, very concerned about her. If she, <laughs> if she, if she just Jesus. popped around on the road and said, "Okay, see if you can find your way back home." <laughs> oh. It's pretty crazy. And then one morning, when he was a, when he was an early teenager, it was still dark. His mum shook him awake and said, "Here's a sandwich. Here's an apple. Here's your bike helmet. I'm not going to give you water because you can go and find some on the way. Head on a 50 mile bike ride down the south coast and to go and stay at your uncle's place for the night." And he was pretty, he was pretty happy. He did it. Stayed the night. Came the right, the big ride back the next day. He was expecting his mum to be super happy and proud that he'd achieved this massive feat. But as soon as he popped in, his mum said, oh, yeah, well done. Now, come on, run along. Old neighbor Joe needs some help chopping some logs. <laughs> awesome. I love this so much. <laughs> this day and age, you'll probably, uh, if the neighbor saw what was happening or if you overheard it, you'd probably call up social services <laughs> yeah. um, to get rid of the, the parent and throw Richard <laughs> into right. a foster home. <laughs> but obviously, right. it turned out to be incredible parenting, which led him um, to what he did in his life because he had this lesson, if it's meant to be, it's up to me. And uh He's always got to stand on his own two feet. So Branson in business, he always believed in himself. He always stood on his own two feet. He always kind of took responsibility and took control, except for one time when he when he didn't, when he relinquished a bit of control. By 1986, Virgin had become one of Britain's largest private companies. They had 4,000 staff and they just had a year-on-year increase in sales of 60%, which is a, that's a pretty solid. After you're already big to then grow 60%, that's massive. You're probably doing some sums in, in your back of the envelope calculations to say, hey, if we went public, how much how much money can I make? And that's what his advisors were telling him, you know, this is what you can make if you cash in and go public. And this is what it, exactly what it did. You know, people were warning him at the time, like what happens when you go public, you, you're not going to be in control as much. But his intuition was also telling him to perhaps, hey, hey, Rich, maybe better off holding control. He went against his gut and sold it and took in the money. Yeah, he got convinced. They said, look, if you get more cash, then you'll be able to do more things. You'll be able to grow. You'll be able to expand the business. And of course, you have a nice little fat wallet in your back pocket as well by cashing in. And so when they went public, 70,000 people signed up for the the initial share offering. And those that missed out on the IPO then queued up on the streets the next day to go to the, the stock market and buy shares in Virgin. And Branson, he walked up and down the lines of people saying, thanks for having faith in the company. Thanks for having faith in, in him as well. And he met a whole bunch of people who, you know, one example is a young couple that said, hey, we're not going on a holiday this year. Instead, we're putting the money that we'd saved into Branson, into Virgin, and we know that you can do it, Richard. Before long, Branson, he started to hate the life of uh, running a public company. 
he had to go into the city every day. So instead of having his casual meeting with his partners on a houseboat about who to sign, it was a lot of fun. He had to go out there and submit uh, requests to the board of directors who would meet at the end of every month. So much less fun when you're just sitting around a table with uh, people in suits. Yeah, a bunch of old dudes. And then, you know, he'd say, okay, hey, we've got an opportunity here. Let's sign the Rolling Stones. And so he's, you know, he's he's got this hot opportunity. Then he's got to wait four weeks for the next board meeting. Then one of the directors says, "Oh, I don't know about the Rolling Stones. My wife doesn't like them." Mm. And you think, okay, you know, it's, you shouldn't be banking on this massive decision just because your wife does or doesn't like this band. Or you know, another old bloke when Branton says, "Oh, we can sign Janet Jackson, this hot new up and coming act." They say, "Oh, who's Janet Jackson?" Oof. So basically, it's like, well, who are you putting your faith in to be doing this? Branson previously he acted. Uh, quickly, he made decisions based on an intuition. He seized opportunities. You know, if something like the Rolling Stones came his way, he could do it straight away. But now he had to wait four weeks. He had to get approval from the board, and ultimately, he was missing a lot of these opportunities. Death by consensus in this case. Early days, they, they doubled their profits in the first year, but after that, things really quickly turned to shit. There was a stock market crash. Virgin shares they dropped hard. It wasn't really his fault, like why it all dropped, but. In himself, he, he let everyone down. All those people he walked across the, you know, who were lining up to buy the shares, who he was speaking to, they'd all lost a whole bunch of money. A lot of them went all in, put all their savings into Big Richard, and he really let him down. For the first time in business, he felt like he wasn't standing on his own two feet anymore. He'd lost control. He felt he was even really getting a little bit depressed as well because everything seemed to be going wrong, and he seemed to not be able to, to take the reins and do what he wanted to do. So that was his lesson is to always stand on his two feet. He made the decision that he's going to go and buy all the shares to take the company private again at a huge personal loss. And uh, I think this really ties into what we were saying earlier about his the, the weight he puts on uh, reputation because he took a serious hit um, to make sure he wasn't letting these people down. So he personally went and borrowed $182 million to buy all the shares back and take the company private. But obviously, in the short term was the hit, but in the long run, being on his two feet, he was able to make the company a success again. Yeah, and he didn't even say, oh, the, the stock's crashed now. I'll just buy it all back. I've, I've cashed in the first time by going public. Now I can buy it back for the cheap. He actually said to everyone, look, I promise I'll buy it back for what you paid. So he didn't have to do it, but again, he just thought, well, that's the right thing to do. And at the end of the day, once he'd taken Virgin Private again, he'd taken it off the stock market. He said it was a day of pure relief because once again, he was the captain of his own ship. He was the master of his own fate and he was standing on his own feet. There's a lot to learn from Richard's stories. He says it doesn't matter what it is or how hard things might seem. Out of all the best lessons he's learned, the one, the pinnacle is just do it. Yeah. In fact, screw it. <laughs> screw it. And just Let's do, do it. it. That's right. He says the beginning is the most important part of any work because if you look way ahead to the end, you're going to see how hard it is to get there. You're going to see the weary miles between where you are now and where you want to be. You're going to see all the dangers that are going to pop up. You're probably never going to take that first step. So he says that whatever you want to achieve in life, uh, you've got to take that first step and really you've got to forget about where you're headed and just say, screw it, let's do it and just get started. So take the first step. There's going to be many challenges. Rely on yourself, chase your dreams, work together with people and of course, believe in yourself. Mm-hmm.